morning everyone um yeah this thing appears to be working so we'll go ahead and get <laughs> go ahead and get started <laughs> um somebody type you can hear me in chat if you can hear me good morning carol morning tom todd all righty so we're, let's go ahead and get started then um I'm Brian Music. I am. <laughs> oh, Mark. Um, I'll be. Uh, <laughs> I'll be doing a uh, presentation on SAE today. Uh, you can see one of my birds behind me here. Please ignore the rest of the mess that is my workshop. But, um, alrighty. Well, let me pull up my uh, presentation. And we'll get started. All righty. So, as I said earlier, I'm going to go over uh, uh, what. Uh, how to convert a discus launch glider to an SAE bird. Uh, and this is uh, just meant to be primer. This is not the be all end all. This is, hey, I'm curious, how can I get into it? So we're gonna start there. Um, so first off, what is SAD? I know I recognize a lot of you from various uh, space modeling teams around the world. I know I saw our friends from Canada and the UK here, but for those that don't know, uh, the Federation Aeronautic International, or the FAI, governs all air sport, and this obviously includes model rocketry, uh, on the international scale. Um, uh, every FAI discipline uh, is given a letter code. The, the two that we all might be most interested in is F, which is aero modeling or model airplanes, and S, which is our good old model rocketry, or S for space modeling. Um, then within each discipline, uh, each event is given an additional number and letter. Uh, so for example, S8 is radio controlled rocket glider, and uh, E, in this case, stands for the impulse class, uh, which is the standard E impulse class we're all used to. Um, just for a little bit of reference, uh, discus launch glider is F3K. F for aero models, uh, three for sailplanes or gliders, and K for discus launch. So specifically, what is SAE? Um, well, as I said, it's a radio control rocket glider event. So the model must ascend vertically under rocket power, um, no super long burn spiraling up to altitude. It's a glider, uh, so it must, descent must be supported by lifting surfaces, and there is a minimum wingspan of 1.1 meters, or about 44 inches for us uh, uh, old school folks, uh, and a maximum gross mass of 300 grams, though honestly I've never seen anybody check. Uh, and then the radio control part comes in, in that it is a precision event. Uh, the duration must be exactly six minutes, and you must land at a target spot. Um, there are, there's a lot more details, a lot more nuance, but, uh, I wanted to get across that these are the three essential parts of SAD. So, okay. first off, I'm going to cover why do we want to even think about discus launch gliders in the first place. Uh, then we're going to discuss how to convert a discus launch or a hand launch glider to a rocket glider. Uh, we're going to talk about the first flight of this glider. Then after the first uh, uh, gliding flight, we're going to talk about the first rocket-powered flight and the preparation therein. Uh, we'll talk about dialing it in. Uh, my suggested starters kit for getting into uh, an SAE, SHE style event. And then we're, at the end, we're going to actually go ahead and make a wing saddle. So first off, why a discus launch glider? Why would we even think about this in the first place? So traditional radio controlled rocket gliders are built towards that minimum allowable wingspan for SAD, which is 1.1 meters. 
Um, discus launch gliders, on the other hand, the F3K event has a maximum allowable wingspan of 1.5 meters. So you can see how those two numbers aren't that disparate. <coughs> Excuse me. And you might be able to say go back and forth between the two different events. Um, both of these styles of gliders are built to withstand pretty extreme um, uh, structural loadings. So a rocket glider obviously has to be built to withstand a very high speed rocket launch and then transition to glide. Uh, discus launch gliders, I would argue, have an even more uh, extreme launch in that they experience probably a few tens of Gs in the, uh, in the spin to go for a discus launch. And it is exactly what it says on the tin. If you've ever seen somebody throw a discus uh, in a track and field event, it is effectively the same technique to throw one of these gliders. Um, the major differences come in, uh, besides the wingspan, traditional uh, rocket gliders uh, are built to a minimum weight, uh, typically even with the rocket motor included, of somewhere between 150 and 175 grams. Um, whereas your typical discus launch glider, 230 might be typical, but anywhere from 200, 210 grams up to about 240, 250. And that's without the rocket motor, which add, typically adds another 30 to 35 grams. Uh, so it's a little bit on the heavier side. And for the traditional glider, that translates into a huge boost altitude. Um, the the, the kind of latest generation of 1.1 meter span models uh, capable of hitting altitudes in excess of 300 meters or 1,000 feet. Um, on the other hand, my discus launch gliders have a, uh, I put modest, more modest boost in, or more modest uh, altitude on boost. Um, I've seen typical 200 to 250 meters, which is 650, 700, 750 feet. On the other hand, because more of the uh, mass of a traditional rocket glider is, excuse me. <laughs> is um the mass of the motor and the wing is smaller they typically have a, a higher <laughs> oh excuse me a higher sink rate um so i'm not going to say it's high it's still a glider but the wing loading is higher so they tend to descend faster that's not necessarily a bad thing um this higher descent rate typically also translates into a relatively high forward speed and so they fly well even on windy days <laughs> By the same token, uh, the discus launch gliders, because that wing is substantially larger for only a modest weight gain, um, does tend to have a lower sink rate. Uh, the other advantage uh, that I don't list here of the, um, or I do list it, I'm sorry, uh, of the uh, discus launch glider is the traditional glider, uh, rocket gliders tend to be two or three channel. So they'll have just elevator rudder control, and then maybe some of the real later ones have a spoiler or a flap of some kind. Uh, discus launch gliders are full full house, or uh, four to six channel. They have aileron, elevator, and rudder control, but they all have um, uh, flap and wing camber control, which means you can go from a, a high uh, lift to drag uh, configuration to a very low sink rate by drooping the uh, flaps and flapperons. Um, so for the traditional rocket gliders, um, they were mostly homebrewed. Uh, I believe, you know, Kevin McCoo uh, made some very limited run kits for a while, and they were reasonably popular with the U.S. team, I think, in the late 90s through the early 2000s. Um, but for the most part, those 1.1 meter span birds are homebrewed um, and, and customized. Um, on the other hand, a discus launch glider, you have a lot of commercial options available because, frankly, uh, F3K and DLG are a much more popular event than uh, SAE. And this means that the event is actually very highly optimized. Um, so there, there's lots of options. They're readily available and they're very good gliders. Um, one of the other big advantages to DLG, though, too, is that it's easy to practice with. Uh, a discus launch, uh, an, an amateur or a, a beginner thrower can easily get 30 to 35 meters on a discus launch. 
um, an experienced thrower, easily in excess of 40 up to 50. And if you're really good, you can get 60 or more. Um, I know my typical launch is on the order of 50 meters, um, but my my uh, personal best is in excess of 60. Um, so really, the, the takeaway here is twofold. Uh, DLGs are readily commercially available, whereas rocket gliders are um, typically homebrewed. Um, and the DLGs have, have more of a bias towards glide. They launch lower, but they also sink slower, uh, whereas the traditional rocket gliders have a bias towards launch, uh, meaning they launch incredibly high, but they tend to sink faster. And on the balance for uh, S8, uh, they tend to end up being roughly the same overall performance. So let's talk about converting a DLG. Um, a discus launch glider is basically a complete glider from the factory. I mean, it is a complete glider from the factory. Um, we don't want to change the aerodynamics. We'd like to still be able to fly it as a discus launch glider. Um, so that means not trimming off the top part of the vertical tail to clear the rocket exhaust. Um, again, the glider that's behind me has flown several dozen times and all that's happened to the vertical tail is there's some soot from the rocket exhaust on it. So there's enough of a gap between the rocket motor and the vertical tail to cool that exhaust off significant, sufficiently that it doesn't damage it. And again, we'd like to be able to switch between a DLG and a radio control rocket glider uh, for practice or if I want to actually go fly an F3K event. So the solution is a removable rocket pod. And you can see in that photo there, that's the that's the first one I made for my uh, first uh, DLG to SAD conversion. That's my Banff. And I do have that rocket pod in a slightly modified form right here. So we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So here you can see a picture. I just uh, wanted to highlight some of the uh, key features of these rocket pods that I've been building. Um, first off, motor thrust line, um, no lower than in, in line with the boom, but typically I like to, to point the nose down just a little bit. Um, there's a couple of aerodynamic reasons I won't get into, but also um, it lifts the rocket exhaust away from the back of the wing, which is where you might have some issues with... Uh, um, with some uh, heat melting of the foam or damage of the carbon fiber. Uh, I have not seen any damage, um, knock on wood, and so this seems to be working. Uh, that being said, you want to keep the center line uh, as close to the glider as possible. Uh, the big reason for this is as, it come, as the glider comes out of uh, whatever launch system you're using, um, it's going at its slowest, and so it has a tendency to uh, pitch forward because that motor is above the center of gravity. Um, once the rock, once the glider is moving at any kind of significant speed, um, the the horizontal tail has more than enough authority to overcome it. It's just that initial departure from the tower. You want to keep that uh, that uh, thrust misalignment as uh, small as possible. Uh, the other thing here, uh, and I'll I'll bring up my uh, pod here, but the uh, every DLG I've ever seen uses countersunk screws to get the heads of the screws below the surface of the wing for minimum drag. Um, I'm sure there's a way that you could do that with these rocket pods, but I haven't figured it out yet. So I switched button head screw um, to, again, kind of get the low profile, but also not damage the uh, fiberglass layup here. And then if you do use balsa wood for that pylon, uh, I recommend using something reasonably thick um, and standard weight balsa. Um, if you use a lighter balsa, it's going to, it, it, you know, the landing forces on these and the uh, launch forces can get rather significant. You are dragging, you know, half a pound of glider behind it. So, um, yeah, use standard 10, 12, 14 pound per cubic foot balsa. There's no need to use contest grade balsa here. Um, so let's talk about the first couple of flights. 
you know, as I said earlier, ultimately this is a glider with a rocket motor attached. So really you want to fly this as you would any other model glider on the first flight. Uh, gentle toss straight in the head, um, and then do that several times to get all your base flight modes tuned. Um, the, uh, you know, again, I'm not really covering the setup of a, of a radio control glider here. There are plenty of people that have covered that and done a much better job than I could. Um, and I have some resources for that at the end here if you're if you're an experience. Um, but likewise for the setup, follow a standard F3K or DLG tuning guide for your glide mode setup. Um, it's more important for a, for a four channel model than it is for a two channel model, uh, rudder elevator. Um, but you know, just tune it, tune it like you would any other uh, glider airplane. So once you are happy, with the performance as a glider, then and only then is it time to get it ready for a rocket flight. But do not try a rocket boost until you're happy with the glide. Um, so a couple keys to boost success. Uh, we really would like to simulate the rocket boost in a safe, controllable, and really the, the key here is terminable manner. Uh, once you start a, a solid rocket engine, you can't shut it off. So we'd like to be able to test this out in a way that means we can uh, abort the test if we want to. Um, the key characteristics to simulate for a rocket launch is we want the thing to be on at high speed and at a low or a zero lift coefficient. Um, there's actually two phases of DLG flight where we can simulate this. Um, we can simulate it on the discus launch uh, after the initial climb out or in a dive. So on the on a discus launch, after you get the nose rotated up into a uh, into a nose high attitude, uh, you want to ensure that the glider zooms straight up with no tendency to bank, yaw, or pitch. So that's basically get all your boost or your zoom trims for your discus launch in place. And we will be using that zoom trim as our boost trim for radio for our radio control rocket glider. Um, my preference is to bias the zoom with a very slightly nose down pitch. Um, me personally, I find it more natural to want to have to pull the glider away from a slight nose over tendency than to push from a from a uh, looping tendency. Um, the other reason for this is that. Uh, when you launch one of these, you're typically standing behind it. So on a, uh, if you have a looping tendency, it can very easily go over your head. And that's a uh, um, recipe for loss of orientation and loss of control. So uh, for at least the first couple of flights, my preference is to have a slight nose over tendency. Um, and here's what that looks like uh, from a dive test. So you might recognize, if you're familiar with radio control uh, airplanes at all, you might be familiar with a dive test. This is uh, typically to test you, the stability of your airplane. Um, if you're testing for glide or flight stability, you'll typically want to see the, the right-hand case is that the airplane pulls out of a dive on its own. However, uh, if we had that tendency on a rocket launch, then that would translate into the glider looping over your head. So what you do is from a, from a high discus launch, once you've pushed it over into a glide, uh, put the glider back into boost mode um, and quickly point the nose more or less straight down and just release the controls entirely and see what the glider does. Um, in that boost mode, the glider should actually either fly straight ahead or, as I said, my preference is to slightly tuck under a little bit and, and go farther nose down. Uh, key here is don't crash your glider into the ground. Uh, once these things are going at high speed, uh, they have plenty of authority to pull out of a dive. Um, and actually, if you flip it into one of the glide modes during this, it will uh, self pull out. But uh, I pull out hard and these, these gliders are built so strong that they can take a hard pull out like this. Um, I have some stories about that I'll share later. <laughs> So first boost, um, boost mode settings, typically I found from a standard F3K setup, uh, dual rates of 35 to 40% on rudder, elevator, and ailerons, 
is more than adequate for a rocket boost. Um, one of the other big things is if your model is so equipped, make sure any flaps or spoilers are locked out. Um, it's not good if you deploy flaps at, you know, 100 miles an hour under a, a rocket boost. Um, that said, for, for motors, my suggestions for a, a one meter conversion, um, one meter span discus launch glider, uh, Either a B6 or a C6 Estes is a good starting point, or the Aerotech C3.4. Um, you know, if you've got a lighter uh, one meter, something closer to 100 grams, a B6. If you got something closer to 150 grams, a C6 works just fine. And then for the for a 1.5 meter conversion, really your best option, no matter what, is an Aerotech uh, D7, which is the half length uh, E6. Um, so on this first boost, you really want to get a low wind or a no wind day. Um, if you have wind, it's going to throw off your uh, your your ability to uh, diagnose. If if your boost something happens on your boost, wind is going to throw off your ability to diagnose it. Partially because you're going to be fighting the wind, and partially just because it's a more stressful launch environment. And then the other big suggestion here is get somebody else to push the button for you and get one or more other people to watch the uh, boost for any problems. Um, your concentration should be on flying the, the airplane. Um, and even if you are you know, fully paying attention and something goes wrong, you are so concentrated on flying the airplane that oftentimes you won't remember exactly what was A couple of problems to, to watch out for, and I've seen these before. Uh, they're relatively easy fixes for these airplanes. Um, there are usually issues with assembly, not the actual construction of the airplane itself. Um, so the first, the big one is flutter, uh, particularly on uh, flapperon models. Uh, those long span flapperons can be prone to flutter on these launches. Um, it, it produces a very characteristic buzzing noise as the frequency of the flutter on these small airplanes is reasonably high on the order of like 20 to 40 hertz. Um, so it'll sound like somebody stuck a playing card in the spokes of a bicycle almost. Um, and again, uh, you know, brief your spotter, let them know what to look for. Um, for for uh, DLGs is typically an easy fix. Well, or at least a reasonably easy fix. Uh, flutter is almost always caused by a loose aileron linkage on these birds. So um, it's just a matter of inspecting your linkages and, and um, ensuring there's no slop. Uh, the, the other big cause um, is, a, is a weak or a damaged servo. Um, so if your linkage look good, looks good, make sure to test your servo as well. Um, and this other one I've only seen once, uh, but the traditional, or I shouldn't say traditional, the, the standard practice for discus launch gliders, uh, at least over the last couple of years, has been used to use what's called a pull spring system uh, on your tail surfaces. So the um, tail, the tail surface is usually pulled one direction by a music wire torsion spring uh, and then pulled the other direction by the servo. Um, so you can have flutter or more likely you'll just have trouble controlling the aircraft on boost. Um, so make sure you use at least a 20 thousandths or a, a half millimeter diameter, uh, hardened use steel music wire, uh, uh, tail spring for a one and a half meter plane. Um, and I say that use music wire. I know there's a temptation to use. Uh, stainless steel spring wire, but uh, it just doesn't have the same um, creep resistance and it doesn't have the same strength as a standard just uh, carbon steel spring wire. Um, the other way to avoid this is that, you know, most airplanes, if the elevator is free to move, uh, will tend to pitch nose down. Um, and so there are discus launch gliders that have a their elevator on the top of the boom and have their elevator on the bottom of the boom. 
So get a visual check here. This would be an example of a glider with the elevator on the top of the boom uh, or and then on the bottom. On the bottom of the boom, the uh, elevator will be pull to go up, spring to go down. Um, and so the tendency, uh, the aerodynamic tendency of the airplane is to want to pitch nose down. Um, and so the positive pull on the uh, tail is to pull nose up. And so those two forces oppose each other, and typically you'll have no problem. If the, uh, if the elevator's on the top of the boom, however, um, nose down uh, and the, uh, the, pool, the pool wire wants to also push the nose down. Um, and so the only thing pulling the nose back up is the spring. Um, so my suggestion in general would be to use a bottom-mounted elevator discus launch glider for rocket boosts. Um, you can use the top mount, um, but you do have to be more careful in the setup and make sure your uh, spring for the elevator is strong enough. Um, so yeah. Hopefully that first flight was successful. If you went through all the, the, the careful steps to set up your glider properly before you even put a rocket motor in it, uh, in it uh, the couple of times I've done it with uh, including this glider here, the one behind me and several other ones has been almost a non, non event. Um, usually, you know, the boost is going to be perfect. But it's close enough that it's you know there's you're not looping or, or pitching down into the ground it's very controllable on boost um that said it usually needs tweaking but uh just tweak the trim uh usually good to go after a couple of boosts uh, you may find on launch that those dual rates are maybe a little high for you on the elevator or maybe even a little low um, feel free to adjust to your taste um and then one of the other things I didn't mention earlier, on the glide, I really recommend making sure one, at least one of your glide modes is really just hands off. Um, as I said earlier, these things boost well in excess of 200, 300 meters. And so uh, doing any hard maneuvering at that kind of altitude or uh, is uh, very difficult because it's relatively difficult to see. Um, and so if you have one flight mode that's just you know, move the rudder and it does lazy turns one way or the other, it very much reduces pilot workload um, and you'll have a better time with it. Um, at one of the events up in Muncie last year, I was able to get this BAMF 2 behind me trimmed well enough that I put it in a turn and took my hands off the controls and it was still in that turn two minutes later. So highly recommend. And then after after you get the first couple of flights in, go for it. For the one meter birds, toss a D two point three in, or for these larger airplanes, uh, E sixes are a lot of fun. So here's my uh, after talking about all that, I'm gonna try and give you my recipe for the the best success on your first try. Um, really, my opinion for a first glider, for a first discus launch glider, or even for a first rocket glider, you cannot beat uh, the Vlad's model ELF. It's a one meter span airplane and it's two channel, it's rudder elevator only, um, but it's very light, it's very strong, um, and it only costs $210 for the bare airframe. Um, with a good set of servos and a receiver, you're looking $100 for a less expensive uh, set of servos and receiver, you could easily be talking 50 or $60 or less. Um, and I would not feel uncomfortable with a, with a less expensive set of servos in this model. And really, this thing has great performance. Uh, it floats great. It can turn on a dime and core the tiniest thermals. Um, and it's a good park flyer. It only weighs 110 grams as a glider. And even once you strap a rocket motor to it, it only weighs 135 grams. Um, so it will float on a mouse fart. Um, you can see my very beat up elf in the picture there, and you'll see it here in real life in a second here. Um, and then on the right there is uh, Trevor Harrison uh, with that same model, uh, minus a few uh, covering patches uh, on a D2.3. That is Harrison's first ever time flying a radio control rocket glider, and he nailed it. Um, it's a very, very forgiving model. 
Um, so a couple other general tips that don't really fall into the conversion, but are kind of important for flying these events or flying these kinds of models. S8 is really a flyer's event. Um, you can build, you can you can talk theory as much as you want, but it you can't be practicing this event. Um, and that's one of the actually I think really important reasons maybe to choose a discus launch glider, um, because you can practice without a motor a rocket motor. Um, and the the E6s do get expensive if you start burning them at that rate. Um, with the exception of the six minute task, uh, you can practice pretty much everything on a discus launch. Personally, I set myself a two minute task in the landing task and uh, just fly it as a discus launch event. Um, and the landing task is definitely a perishable skill. Um, I've uh, had it go bad in the past and I've had to work to get it back. So uh, definitely something you need to keep practice on. One of the other big things, if you're going to be flying these models at contests, or even if you're, you know, you have to get in a car to go to the field, uh, these models are large, they're, they can be expensive, and they're somewhat fragile, uh, at least for handling. They're extremely strong as airplanes, but um, as anyone knows, uh, strong as an airplane is still pretty fragile on the ground. Um, so really, I suggest uh, getting a, some sort of travel case to protect your gliders. Um, on the right there, you see uh, my particular choice. That's a uh, Plano Parallel Limb Bow Case, um, but it's 42 inches long, and the fuselages on these uh, gliders tend to be somewhere around 38 inches long, as you can see there. Uh, so it's a very good fit for these airplanes. Um, and the other big thing, I'm not going to go into my ground support equipment because it's it's a little bit complicated, um, but make sure you get some good ground support equipment and learn how to use it well. Um, one thing I didn't talk about for this event is that you typically have to make five or six flights in the space of an hour and a half. Um, so being able to recycle your airplane and your ground support equipment quickly is important. Uh, linger here too long. I've uploaded a PDF version of this to the uh, to the Excel events, so you can download it there and go through this. Um, but I have this is a couple of good resources um, for uh, getting into this. Uh, Kennedy Composites there is the U.S. reseller for Vlad's model. It's a good source for the Elf, and they carry the high quality servos, the KST uh, A06Ns uh, would be the modern choice. Um, that said, there are other uh, servos that would work just fine that are less expensive than those. Uh, George Gassaway has uh, excellent resources for both a tower launcher and a tower launcher base, and the link is there. Uh, when I looked this morning, his website seems to be down, but hopefully it'll be back up soon. Um, and then I think one of the, also one of the most invaluable resources for this uh, this event and F3K and discus launch gliders in general is the Radio Control Group's uh, DLG forum with the link listed there. It's a really, really good resource. There's lots of reviews on a bunch of different models, and the people there are all really nice. Um, especially And then especially at the top of that forum, there are several sticky threads that cover the construction setup and first flights for this launch glider. Um, that's really wide and covered here. It's covered way, way better there. Okay, so let's see. It passed, so we got 20 minutes. Um, I am going to switch over to here. Let me move my camera around for a minute. And we are going to convert my ELF to a radio control rocket glider. Um, so you see I've got everything's kind of pre-staged pre here. Uh, big thing you're going to need, obviously, is a glider. See my magical Technicolor ELF here. Um, I have some uh, mold release wax. Uh, you don't need the specific wax. Uh, Caranuba wax for polishing cars works just fine. Um, I have my 
uh, re my laminating resin all set out. I use uh, US Composite 635 uh, with the fast hardener. This stuff is available in small quantities, which is why I usually recommend it to beginners. Um, I have uh, paper towels ready to go. Um, I have four strips of three ounce fiberglass, plain weave fiberglass cloth here, um, a spreader, some sticks, my gram scale. Always use gloves when doing epoxy, um, and a uh, ink uh, ink roller for um, removing excess resin from the layup. My table also here. I don't know if you can see it. My table here is covered by a layer of uh, clear plastic to protect the table. So first things first, we'll take our uh, glider wing and uh, let's see. Some clear plastic packaging tape. And we just want to cover the center of the wing from the leading edge to the trailing edge in plastic, in packing tape. Now, you really want to try and get this as smooth as you can, but it's not critically important that there are no bubbles in it. So i um, just going to rub it on there. And make sure you leave a tag at the end so it's easy to get off. So our goal here is I have this carbon strip in the middle of the wing. You can see it between the purple sections here. We'd like to cover most of that with our wing saddle. Once you've done that, um, the epoxy resin will release from the tape uh, almost no problem. Um, but I like to add a layer of wax just to make sure. Uh, this stuff's very easy to use. Just kind of wipe it on, let it sit for about 30 seconds, and wipe it right back off again. And we'll do one more round just for good measure. So tapes to my desk. All right, so as I said earlier, when working with epoxy, make sure to use proper PPE, in this case, uh, vinyl gloves. And I always use a gram scale, especially for these laminating resins. It is absolutely um, uh, critical that you get this mixture ratio correct. So this is a four to one. So we're going to measure out eh, eight grams of res or ten grams of resin. And two and a half grams of this hardener.
And the key to working with any epoxy resin is that everything needs to be thoroughly mixed. So scrape the sides of your cup thoroughly and mix for a good two or three minutes. Now, this particular resin is a uh, 15 minute pot life. Um, however, once we get this spread onto the fiberglass, uh, that working time goes up substantially. Now, personally, I like to wet the fabric out before I put it on, especially when we're working with multiple layers like this. Um, it's easier to uh, get the fabric completely wetted out, um, and it is also easier to remove excess resin uh, before you put it on the airplane. And honestly, right now, don't worry too much about all the little wispies coming out the side. Uh, we're going to trim those off once we're done. So wet out the first piece of fabric. You can see it's gone nice and translucent. Uh, and then we're just gonna put the second piece on, get it roughly centered, press it down and you will see the resin start to wick up through the second piece. Now we don't have to enough on there to completely wet it out. But as soon as I just drag the scraper across it, it's almost completely wet out. And we'll just need a little bit more up at the front here to get it completely wet out. And just continue doing the same thing until you get all four layers nice and stacked up. Now, I, as I said earlier, this is four layers of three ounce plain weave cloth. Um, this is a little excessive. I think probably you could go back a layer, but this has worked incredibly well for me. And I'm both uh, uh, reluctant to fix something that ain't broke and also to have a rocket motor uh, come off of my glider and have it fly free. So. I'll take a slightly overweight pod if it means that I'm sure that the rocket motor is not going anywhere. All right, so that's pretty much completely wet out. You can see through it, it's very it's very translucent. So we're just gonna take a piece of paper towel. I'm gonna get a bigger piece. Put it over the top, grab our roller, and just roll back and forth over the, uh, uh, over the layup. The goal here is just to remove any excess epoxy in the layup. I don't know if you can see that. We got it mostly good, but there's a little bit of uh, light color there. That's where we soaked up some excess resin. So we'll just use our scraper to kind of get up under one of the corners here. Comes right up off the the um, plastic we laid down earlier.
and not get epoxy all over my airplane. So we'll just take our glider, make sure our tape is all nice and firmly pressed down. Take our cloth. Uh, we want to make sure we cover both of our wing bolt holes because this is what's going to hold us on. And then just lightly, let me get this out of the way. Lightly, just press it in to conform with the wing shape. And yes, you could vacuum bag this or uh, apply other pressure to it, but I find this gets you close enough. And this is really, I intend this to be a real simple, low stress, easy way to get into this. One of the keys now, once this is cured, I'll let this cure for a couple of days. It should cure overnight, but I'll let it cure for a couple of days. Before you remove this from the wing, you wanna get into these wing bolt holes and drill out the holes for the bolts from the back. Um, and that'll ensure everything's lined up. There's no misalignment. Um, and then uh, and then you're good to go. Uh, you would glue. <clears throat> Let me, where's my. What you would do is you just uh, cut out a short piece of balsa wood and then glue a uh, motor tube and a nose cone on it, just like you would, um, let me get my face back in the frame here, just like you would a normal model rocket. Uh, the key is, and I found it's very easy to do, if you take a full length piece of uh, BT-50 uh, and use a coupler, you can uh, kind of set this on the saddle um, and then use the piece of tube to make sure it's aligned with the tail boom, so. Uh, after that demonstration, do I have any questions? Oh, it looks like I do. Um, so Pat Fitzpatrick asks, says, comment, be very conscious of sun position when launching. Uh, losing glider orientation to sun glare can lead to unintended excitement. Absolutely. Um, the goal of the way I have this uh, uh, demonstrated the uh, setup here is that boost should be a non-issue. Um, the only issue with uh, flying through the sun with one of my gliders is that I might lose sight of it, but it will just keep going straight up. So you, sh uh, you should be able to trim a DLG such that it will fly straight even with no input on rocket launch. Uh, uh, Don... Vetter asks, BAMF2 light strong or standard? My BAMF and BAMF2 are both standard layups. I would imagine that a light layup would probably work fine and you'd save about 5 to 15 grams, depending on the model. Uh, Terrell Willard asks, thrust inclined, positive or negative? You want the thrust, you want down thrust, two or three degrees of down thrust. So, um, Let's see. This your wing, you'd like the, I'm going to exaggerate, the motor to be pointed nose down, um, but only a couple degrees. Uh, zero degrees or maybe two to three degrees down works great. Um, Mark Sternat asks, how do you find a club or group that takes part in SAD? Um, there is a very small group of us in the U.S. It's mostly um, we're from all over the place. I know there's a, a group of guys at the uh, Virginia um, uh, Narhams and Novar group that does SAD and rocket gliders. Um, but for the most part, there's a dozen, dozen and a half of us in the States that participate. Uh, so the best bet is to, uh, if you're in the States, to contact uh, uh, or to look on the NAR webpage under the space modeling section um, for information um, or just contact me directly. 
or there's a group of us as well, and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. As far as a launcher, uh, no, there's nothing commercially available, but a link in the presentation to uh, George's Rocketry pages has plans for an S8 launcher. Let's see what else. Does the spent motor casing pop out after boost? Uh, no. So one of the rules of these uh, rocket glider events specifically, so that's the kind of the difference between a boost glider and a rocket glider. Boost glider separates a pod or some sort of boost mechanism. Um, rocket glider requires everything to come down in one piece. So we carry the, uh, excuse me, we carry the spent motor casing in the pod with us in the glide. It adds a small drag penalty, but uh, for the, the large one and a half meter discus launch gliders, um, it's, I mean, the manufacturer recommends that you can ballast the BAMF up to over 400 grams in heavy winds if you need to. So it's not really too much of an issue. Yeah, George Rackor asks, on the pod, is the hole drilled in the body tube? Yeah, so that's just a... Uh, there you go. You can see it. That goes all the way through. That was just made using a hole punch. And yes, that allows me to access the forward screw on this pod. Rear screw is easy to get to. Um, so Pat Fitzpatrick says, seems like the large speed range would have boost or would have big trim changes. Uh, you would think, except trim is a way to give you angle of attack. And so for a regular airplane, yeah, it would be a big change in uh, trim. Uh, but the um, since we want to fly basically zero angle of attack, zero lift the whole time, uh, the trim doesn't change. Yeah, I already... Running screw. Any other DLG candidates you like? Um, well, I like my BAMPs. Personally, if you're going for a meter and a half glider, obviously they work well. Um, I've won several U.S. Cups, and I took eighth at the 2021 Worlds with it. Uh, that being said, uh, the Snipe is a popular choice uh, for overseas flyers. Um, there's a 1.2 meter called the Stiletto that's popular with U.S. flyers, though I personally am not a huge fan of it. Um, uh, if you have something you like, chances are you can convert it. Um, they, As far as I can tell, they all work pretty well. Um, Dave Shigoda asks, is the ejection charge ducted out? Yeah, we use plug motors for these. Um, for the, uh, if you're using an SDS B or C on a smaller model, yeah, we duck the ejection charge out the top. All right, I think that's it. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Sorry if I didn't answer your question. Uh, the presentation is uploaded to the Excel event site. Uh, have a good day.